to go ahead and kick off everyone. Um, and before we do, I want to do a quick introduction on myself and my uh, guest joining me this morning. So my name is Samson Magid. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of HealthSnap. And joining me today, we have Dr. Eugene Noor and Jamie Morgan from Robeson Healthcare Corporation, a uh, federally qualified health center. Um, thank you, Dr. Noor and Jamie, for joining us for a very uh, exciting and collaborative discussion around um, remote patient monitoring uh, in FQHCs, uh, specifically around the 2024 Medicare physician fee schedule final ruling. So there's a lot of exciting changes, a lot to talk about, uh, and we have an hour to do that this morning. Um, in addition to going through the final ruling today, we'll also be doing a fireside chat with the Robeson Healthcare team, um, where I'll be asking them questions specifically from an FQHC that has implemented RPM, and then you know some of the implications about how they think about RPM in the future moving forward as well. So um, we're going to start off with just an overview of what has been kind of the history of RPM within FQHCs um, through the fee schedule over the last several years. What are the changes that are being proposed in the 2024 uh, final ruling? What, how that's going to affect uh, FQHCs and RHCs on January 1st of next year? Uh, and then uh, we'll do a deep dive into just some of the, the Q&A as well around the actual mechanisms for RPM. Um, and, and there's RTM as well, but we'll focus on RPM today. So um, those are the main areas that we'll talk through. And then we'll wrap up with that fireside chat for the last 20 or 30 minutes or so. And then I would highly recommend everyone, if you have questions throughout, um, there is a Q&A tab at the top of the Zoom webinar. So you'll see that. Click on the Q&A. Um, you can just drop in a question right there. Uh, the HealthSnap team that's on the call as well will be answering those questions as, as you submit them. Um, and if there are ones that require a live response, I will do my best to answer those at the end of the webinar today as well. So let's, let's go ahead and kick off and we'll talk through just an overview here. So um, I think it's first off really important just to define RPM. Um, I think there's a lot of, con not confusion, but it has evolved over time where um, at the simplest definition, RPM involves the connect collection and analysis of patient physiological data. So we're talking about monitoring a physiological data point that can be blood pressure, body weight, blood glucose, um, oxygen saturation, et cetera, outside of a traditional bricks and mortar healthcare environment. The data, the physiological data is then used to develop and manage a treatment plan related to that patient's chronic and or acute health illness or condition. Um, throughout the last several years, especially in light of COVID, um, there's been significant grant funding that's um, been able enabling RPM within FQHCs and RHCs to cover the costs of implementing an RPM program, the device costs, the infrastructure costs, to clinically staff a program like this. Um, and that's obviously fantastic. But what that doesn't enable is long-term sustainability. So what happens when the grant funding runs out? Um, how do we actually use the funds in a way that um, is economically sustainable for um, the FQHC and RHC. And then I think most importantly, the roadblocks over the last several years where CMS has heard commentary around significantly is that there's not reimbursement around RPM and RTM uh, specifically for FQHCs and RHCs. And that is a major limiter of uh, sustainability and long-term growth for a population that desperately needs uh, to be monitored at home and has a huge opportunity to impact their health and care outside the four walls of the clinic. So the grant funding at, at the end of the day was a short-term fix to a long-term um, issue. Um, there has been ongoing challenges about just what happens when the grant ends. And I think CMS obviously has heard our commentary and has proposed new ruling for 24 and beyond. So, um, as a history of FQHGs and RHCs when it comes to virtual care management programs, um, there has been a code called G0511, it's a fix G0511, that's specifically designed for RHCs and federally qualified health centers to um, build and implement care management programs. And prior to 2024, so 23 and prior, these programs have been centered around um, care management programs like chronic care management, behavioral health integration, BHI, principal care management. In 2023, chronic pain management was included, but there was a very clear carve out that RPM and RTM from 2023 and prior would not be covered in that G code. So we had opportunities to implement a quote unquote CCM program or PCM program 
but not RPM. So if I gave a patient a device and I'm monitoring their vitals, I couldn't build a G code. So it, it seemed like there was a gap there. And um, in 2024, in the proposed ruling, and now um, fortunately in the final ruling, CMS has finally included RPM, RTM, uh, CHI, and principal illness navigation to that G0511 code. All of these care management programs are designed with you know three things in mind from an FQHC or RHC's perspective. The first is obviously, how are we improving patient outcomes? How are we decreasing utilization and actually helping people stay healthy at home instead of running to the hospital? And how are we driving long-term sustainability through a reimbursement model that's actually scalable and enables um, an FQHC or RHC to initiate these programs with their internal resources or to partner with an organization that actually offers virtual care management software devices like for RPM or services like clinical care management services. And we'll talk about that a little bit afterwards. So at the end of the day here, um, FQHCs and RHCs had a really good baseline to actually bill and incorporate care management services for a population that um, typically has multiple comorbidities or polychronic populations. And you know, underserved populations. And now with the addition of RPM and RTM, it creates more opportunities now for FQHCs and RHCs to engage their populations while they're home. All right, so let's get into the crux of the actual final ruling and what uh, the implications are. So um, this is straight from the fee schedule. We're finalizing our proposal to include RPM and RTM in the general care management HCPCS code G0511 when these services are furnished by RHCs and FQHCs. So that's a really big win. Again, this is the first year, 2024 and beyond, that that has been included in the G0511 code. Um, the kicker and what was new uh, information in the final ruling compared to the proposed ruling earlier this year is that CMS clarified that the code G0511 can now be billed multiple times per month to account for multiple care management services provided to the patient. Um, there was no carve out that it said there's a maximum number of times that the code can be billed, meaning that for every 20 minutes you spend with a patient for RPM or chronic care management or PCM, you can bill that G0511 code once, twice, or three times, depending on how many services are being provided to that patient. The highlighted portion is a really important distinction. As long as all the requirements are met and resource, court, resource costs are not counted more than once, you can bill that code multiple times. And so the distinction there, and um, I, as a disclosure, I'm not an attorney, um, but the distinction there is that if you're doing CCM for a patient, um, that would be 20 minutes of time, one G0501 code. If you're doing CCM and now you have a connected health device, a connected RPM device, and you're monitoring that patient's physiological vital signs remotely, now you can bill for the 20 minutes spent reviewing that data from that patient. Um, and you can bill the G0511 for the chronic care management care plan review and the physiological data monitoring and coordination of care and care plan on the RPM side as well. So you can have additional codes. Um, something that CMS did a little differently this year is Prior to 2024, in terms of the reimbursement rate, they had taken the average reimbursement amounts for all the care management codes to determine the G0511 reimbursement rate. What ended up happening is if they took that same protocol to create the reimbursement rate in 2024, including RPM and RTM, those reimbursement rates were significantly lower than the other ones. And so it brought the average down quite a bit. So it ended up being, if they had done it that way in the fee schedule they showed, it brought it down significantly. So what they ended up doing to determine the reimbursement rate for the G code that includes RPM is they actually took a weighted average of utilization rates across all of the care management codes. So they took the most recently available utilization rates for every care management program. Um, some of you may recognize these codes here, but this is RPM, CCM, RTM, um, PCM, all of those care management codes are now listed. And then based on the 2021, the most recent utilization data, they're creating a weighted average to determine the actual reimbursement rate based on those um, uh, uh, fee schedules that are created today for those HCPCS codes. What that ends up being is a $71.68 reimbursement rate for G0511 per patient, per code, per month. So again, if you spent 20 minutes for CCM, 20 minutes for RPM, you can bill that twice for the same patient in the same month. 
as long as those services are not duplicative and you're segmenting time. Um, something else that I wanted to you know, call out and make very clear, um, they did clarify a couple of things for RPM and for FQHCs and RHCs specifically, there was a clear indication about the consent process. And so um, the consent process does not have to be required and obtained at the initiating visit for CCM that must be performed by the RHC or FQHC, but it can be obtained at that time. So there's a lot of questions about, do I need to get consent when I'm establishing my patient in the office, or can this be done you know, through general supervision by uh, an outsourced company or partner? Um, and that second part, again, this is straight from the fee schedule, clarifies this. So if the consent is separately obtained, it may be obtained under general supervision, meaning the physician, the ordering provider can be in a physical location. The person obtaining consent can be in a remote location like their home and can be verbal as long as it is documented in the medical record and includes notification of the required information. The additional clarification here is that the beneficiary consent can be obtained at the same time the CCM service is initiated and most importantly, by auxiliary staff who work to furnish the CCM services and they clarify that it can be a contracted staff member. So if you're partnering with an organization like HealthSnap, for example, that does enrollment services, you can now through this final ruling, enable the enrollment individual to do the consent process verbally on the phone, as long as it's documented in the patient's chart. Um, they do not need to be clinical. It can be a non-clinical auxiliary staff member, and this can be done via general supervision, meaning they don't need to be in the same physical office location as the ordering provider. So again, this is all effective January 1st. Um, we did put a link here, and we'll share the slides out afterwards, and um, I can actually share it in the, in the chat here for everyone. Um, this takes you right to the, um, actually, let me share it to everyone. If everyone wants to see, this takes you right to CMS's website where you can see the fee schedule and the final fee for the G0511 code of 7168. So they took the most recent utilization data, again, did the weighted average, and it came out 7168. So um, final implications. Again, this is a major win for FQHGs and RHCs. There's an opportunity to now start enabling uh, proactive ongoing care in the home. It creates an opportunity to now bridge the gap from, all right, we got, we got grant funding. It got us from 2020 to where we are today. Where do we go next? Um, enabling RPM now within an FQHG and RHC is a huge opportunity to now take you know, pick off from the foundation that was set. I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of learnings that Dr. Noor and Jamie will share um, from their program. Uh, and then how do we take that and actually implement a long-term sustainable and impactful RPM program? Um, there's now opportunities to update workflows. So we're capturing that time element for RPM. So again, 20 minutes of time to be able to build a G-code for RPM or any care management program. Um, and now we can start time tracking for those programs. Um, being able to create more comprehensive care plans that are consistent um, and tracked for every patient with specific goals. And if a patient's already enrolled in GCM, so if they were a chronic care management patient enrolled in, in general care management within your FQHC, um, by enabling them to have a device, if they already have one, or adding a device with, you know, with that patient's care management, you now have more opportunities to engage that patient through that physiological monitoring, if readings are out of range, for example, to spend more time with that patient to ensure that they're staying healthy at home. Um, and of course, as you spend that time enabling the billable units of G0511 that can be tracked through a reporting tool that has all the time elements requirements built into the platform itself. So uh, the takeaway here is that again, we're creating long-term sustainability. It enables um, an organization that may not have been able to do this prior with the ruling in 2023 and earlier to now leverage other an in-house resource team or partner with a virtual care management solution to set these workflows up, uh, drive improved clinical outcomes and ROI, and uh, enhance your bottom line through a new revenue stream, whether it's through um, existing general care management programs or the addition of RPM now to your care management programs by um, creating more opportunities to engage with patients more frequently based on the addition of RPM. So I'm gonna pause there actually and open up some Q and A. Um, so if there's any questions that I know I'd like to have uh, and put in the chat, um, we're, we're happy to spend a couple minutes right now. 
Um, if there are not, um, and we want to go, you know, we, we, we'll, we can wait a couple minutes and then go to Dr. Noor and the Robeson team here as well as a, as a, a next step. All right, Dr. Noor and Jamie, we're going to go over to, to both of you now and go through the fireside chat. So I'm going to go out of full screen for a second here. Um, I hope everyone can still see my screen. And we're going to kick off here. So Dr. Noor, Jamie, why don't you guys both start off with an introduction on Robeson and yourselves and your roles at Robeson? And then I can go through, you know, talking through your experience with RPM or other care management programs in the past. And then, you know, we'll, we'll go a little bit into like, you know, long-term implications as well, given the, the information we just reviewed as, uh, together here. Uh, certainly, Samson. Thank you. And, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here. And thank you for taking the time out of your day to join uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Eugene Knorr. I'm a family physician uh, here working in Robeson County in North Carolina, southeastern North Carolina. Uh, I've been with RHCC for 11 years now. I've spent uh, seven of those seeing patients as a board certified physician, and I became a full time chief medical officer uh, about seven years ago. Uh, really loving, loving my job, learning a lot. Uh, RACC is uh, an FQHC that is very devoted to providing primary care throughout the uh, county. Uh, we have nine sites, one of those being a mobile unit that we take to elementary schools on a weekly basis. And we also have a dental program. We have a nice behavioral health program. We have a healthy start program, a prevention program, as well as a Ryan White program. Uh, we also have uh, an extensive residential program on the behavioral health side, which uh, takes in patients suffering from substance use disorder. Uh, particularly uh, looking at those the females uh, of childbearing age that have either delivered a, a child recently or are pending a delivery, uh, make sure that they can have a nice safe outcome for both themselves and their baby once they deliver. Uh, Jamie, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself. Okay, well, my name is Jamie Morgan. I'm a physician assistant and I've been with the Robinson Healthcare Corporation uh, since uh, 2003, uh, I've been uh, just uh, in primary care um, up until 2018 when I also became the uh, clinical director, um, and that's pretty much me. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Dr. Nora, Jamie, thank you guys so much for taking the time again and, and uh, your expertise in the call today. I'm sure everyone's very interested to hear your experience with RPM uh, to date, and then how you're thinking about this in the future. So I, I just want to start off with just talking about as a high level, you know, prior to implementing RPM, I mean, obviously you guys have experienced over the last several years now, um, what, what did it look like managing patients with chronic conditions um, before you were able to implement RPM? Um, what was the typical, you know, experiences you had with those, you know, comorbid or polychronic populations? And then um, what led you to actually start looking at RPM as a solution um, to implement within Robeson. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, I, I think everyone probably uh, knows the answer to this question. Uh, be before uh, RPM, uh, we did what basically everyone uh, else did uh, for decades uh, in, in the in the office setting. Uh, you, you see your patients every three months or so, maybe a little more frequently. If their blood pressures are not controlled, they're not doing well, maybe a little less frequently if they're doing extremely well. Uh, you try to encourage patients to take home blood pressure readings on their own and uh, rely on the patients to bring in uh, handwritten uh, pages uh, of their readings and the dates they took them, the times of day they took them. And un unfortunately, we all know uh, how, how that works. Uh, the, the compliance rate certainly is not high for, for most of us in, in that kind of setting, and, but that's what we had to deal with for many, many years. Uh, when RPM came out, that, that most definitely uh, changed everything and brought on a new wave of, of doing medicine here at RHCC. 
Jamie, anything to add there? Oh yeah. <laughs> You're like, where I do I start? <laughs> probably most, most most providers are are used to uh, seeing the the patients. They they in in invariably they lose the little uh, log book that you might give them. So then you're uh, left with uh, trying to transcribe blood pressure readings off the backs of envelopes and uh, grocery lists and, and that sort of thing, if they remember to check their blood pressures at all. So how, how did you guys, um, how did you guys kind of come to RPM? Like where, what, where, what got you to that point to say, hey, this is an, an, an alternative that we think is extremely has an opportunity to be extremely impactful. How, how did you get to that ultimate decision to start looking at RPM as an alternative, or a, I'll call it a new paradigm or gold standard of way you know, how you manage these conditions? Certainly. Well, I've been certainly reading uh, a lot of articles over the past few years before we initiated RPM here at the corporation, and just seeing the benefits that it held. Yeah, so I was looking into it uh, with a lot of my colleagues here. And we decided it might be a good idea, but uh, one one drawback was the money. Uh, needed the money to buy devices, uh, partner with a vendor uh, to get everything up and running. So we really uh, were just kind of uh, still flying on the seat of our pants, basically doing it the old fashioned way uh, until thankfully HRSA uh, released a grant uh, dedicated to remote patient monitoring for patients with uncontrolled hypertension. And when we saw that grant, we, we most certainly jumped on it and we're fortunate enough to qualify uh, our UDS numbers for controlled hypertension have historically been in the low 50% range between 50 to 55% uh, of a uh, our denominator being controlled. So we, we definitely needed some help. And when, once this grant came up, came on and we were eligible, uh, we ran and made sure we got we got it and went from there. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, so you, it's a good segue right now to say like, all right, you obviously saw the clinical ROI and the applications and literature. Um, as you guys were looking for partners and, you know, there's a lot of RPM and different vendors and partners out there. Like what were, the, what were some of the top factors that led to your ultimate decision as you guys did your evaluation, you know, with us up front? For me, uh, the, the, the number one factor that I used to decide who we were going to go with was, do you want, how do you want the, the device to communicate from the patient to the provider? Do you want a Bluetooth device? Or do you want a cellular device? And in this area, uh, Bluetooth is still not widely available in the area. We are a very rural uh, setting. A lot of our patients don't have internet uh, at their homes. So we figured cellular would be the better way to go. And uh, we honestly had a very, very difficult time uh, locating a vendor that had cellular devices available. Uh, validated cellular devices available. Uh, if the few that did, uh, they, they didn't have um, a variety of cuff sizes available. They would only come in the uh, standard adult size. They wouldn't have an extra large size to go with the cellular device. You would have to switch over to a Bluetooth device. So for me, that was number one, because I, I, I knew from the very beginning in, in our rural environment, that there was no way we were going to be able to succeed if we gave our patients a Bluetooth device. And then after that, uh, of course, money is always uh, a factor. Uh, fortunately, we had the grant uh, to help us with that. And we also wanted to make sure we had uh, a vendor that was reputable. Uh, definitely made sure we did background checks. Uh, I, I recommend anyone uh, that's looking at getting a vendor, uh, definitely look at their background. Uh, ask your vendor that you're talking with uh, if they can refer you to some of the other customers that they've been working with. And if, if they're a good, reliable vendor, they'll be more than happy uh, to, to give you some of their customers to reach out to and talk with privately one-on-one -on -one 
just to see how well things are working with, with, with that customer. You know, we, we did that with HealthSnap and uh, they had everything we needed and that, that's what made us go with HealthSnap. Jamie, anything else to add on, on your perspective about like some of the top things that you know, things that were top of mind for you as you were evaluating partners? Well, I, I think uh, Dr. Knorr uh, hit on the major things uh, that we were considering. Uh, I think also it would just seem that HealthSnap was willing to really work with us. They were really listening to what our desires were for the you know the specifications of the machines uh and also um the the management and uh accessibility of the data was very important perfect yeah and, and those are all really really valid points and we'd be the first ones to say that um you know trust and credibility with a partner it's not these types of like relationships are not vendor like hey you're selling a software and then we'll see you every quarter these are really tightly knit partnerships that have patient implications around them and so i think all the points both of you just made are really critical to evaluating who the right partners are for your organization specifically because everyone has their own you know i would say perspective on how they manage their patient care and um, this is not a, a widget that you just turn on and off it's a really important relationship that has to be aligned from the beginning um, so i appreciate you both sharing that um, let's get into like oh, the and um, just just one other thing, uh, Samson. Everybody, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Samson. No problem. But I, I just want to touch on the uh, patient portal. Uh, very very user friendly patient portal. Uh, wh whatever vendor you you tend to go with, make sure you look at the portal. That's going to be available for you to look at to track your patients for uh, RPM, and uh, make sure it's very user friendly. Make sure it's easy to log into. Make sure it's very easy to navigate. Uh, I've I found HealthSnap's portal to be one, very easy to access, two, very easy to navigate around, and three, uh, had numerous ways to show us the providers the data. Uh, you could look at it in a chart form. You could look at it in, in various graph forms. You can set alerts uh, as to when you want to be notified in, in red text that someone's blood pressure is not in the range you want them to be at. Uh, you can even re receive messages when someone's blood pressure is out of range. And you also want to try to look at, uh, to see if you can get the uh, portal to integrate into your electronic medical record system. That, that's key. We, we, we all know uh, as, as you add more programs in, in, into, your, in, into your venue, you add more work. So you, you want to try to add as little extra work as you can. So if, if your vendor can have a nice, easy way to integrate into your EMR, that way when, when your patients do their blood pressure readings, those readings can integrate right into the EMR system, go right into that patient's chart, that, that's optimal. Uh, really saves a lot of time uh, on the providers and the other clinical staff trying to log into another system, and look up a patient and then review their data. It can already be there in the EMR system. Just another thing I, I wanted to point out to make sure you really look at uh, before you um, jump on board with, with any kind of vendor for RPM. The interoperability you just touched on there is a critical component. And um, the point I'll just add to that as well, and I think you you both would agree with this, It's it's not a binary, yes, no, we inter interface with the EHR, but how do you actually do it? Um, are you sending a PDF and a media file and then you have to go and try to find that? Is it within an encounter and a flow sheet row, for example, within the context of a clinician's workflow? Um, is it actually disruptive to the workflow or is it embedded within the current workflow? And that's a really important distinction about how you actually scope out an, an interface work and you know, something that is really important up front as well. So those are really, really great points to consider as a, a part a part of implementing a <clears throat> scalable you know, program, which is really what I was going to go into next from, from both your perspectives about, you know, what are the, the tips and tricks? Like, what have you found to be something that you've implemented that was that's working really well? What are the things that you've learned along the way that were like, hey, we did this and we stumbled a little there and we won't do that again. But now we learned that this is the right way to actually implement it and do it that way. Um, anything you can share there for our audience about tips and tricks and lessons you've learned? Oh gosh, most definitely. 
<laughs> yeah, this was new to us. Uh, we had never done an RPM before. Uh, and so this was very new. Uh, we, we were definitely just got kind of going day by day. Uh, we I learned uh, as time moved on and I kind of look back on things. Uh, I wish we would have had a dedicated uh, committee set up to regularly meet and, and discuss RPM. Uh, but we, we didn't have that. Uh, of course, I was involved with a lot of chatting uh, with Hell Snap. Uh, Jamie Morgan was involved, and we had our uh, QI leads involved. But uh, aside from that, that there was there wasn't any formal get-togethers uh, internally. Yeah, you know, once we were done meeting with Hell Snap, we just kind of went on our merry way and did our own thing and waited for the next steps and someone might have came up with an idea and it just went through an email or a text message and we didn't meet formally. And I really regretted that because there's things you don't know. Uh, if you haven't done the program already, there, there's a lot of workflows you have to think about. You know, the things that Samson already brought up, you know, is, is the portal going to integrate into the medical record system? If not, how are you going to get the data? into the medical record system. Uh, when you have patients that aren't being compliant with, with submitting their, checking their blood pressure readings, how are you gonna reach out to them and send them, give them a reminder to, hey, start, we want you to check your blood pressure. Is it gonna be a, who's gonna do that? Are you gonna sign someone at a health center? There's gonna be someone in administration that's gonna do that. Mm -hmm. And it's really a lot to think about because numbers pile up. Yeah, we, we've we enrolled, I, I believe, uh, over the course of our grant, uh, over 700 uh, patients. Uh, certainly, they're not all active at this point. Uh, you get, some, you get, certainly get your dropouts and you get um, patients that they still have an account, but they're not really checking their blood pressures on a regular basis. So we, we, we uh, kind of stumbled on that uh, when it happened. And we didn't know what to do at first. So then we had to kind of figure out, we had to dedicate someone. We got our nursing staff and our nursing director involved. Uh, hey, can, can you guys help to uh, re reach out to these patients that aren't submitting their data? We got, we got our nursing director to take the lead on receiving notifications uh, on the patients that haven't been transmitting data. And then she would go and forward patient lists to our various health center sites, depending on who their provider was send them over to that site and then let the provider and the nursing team reach out to the patients on a more of a one-to-one -one level uh, to help encourage them to, to do the data. Uh, uh, also, uh, you know, uh, who's going to be observing the data? Who's going to be tracking the data? It's one thing that you're uh, doing the program and you have patients enrolled and, and all that, but uh, who from an administrative standpoint is gonna see if the program's successful. It's one thing if you're enrolling patients and they're transmitting blood pressure readings, but what the end result, is it helping? Yeah, and and uh, it took us a while to really see that it was helping. We weren't looking at it, it, it sounds stupid to say, but we weren't in the beginning. We were so heavily focused on just getting it out there, outreaching to the community about the program, get it, getting as many patients enrolled as we could and make sure they're, 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 they're compliant with doing their readings and that the patients, uh, the port providers can access the portal and see the data and then follow up on it. We weren't looking at the overall outcome. But then when, once we finally start looking at the outcome, we're like, hey, th th this is really, really helpful. We have patients that have stage one, stage two blood pressure, and, and we're dropping their systolics a, a good 10 plus points and, and reducing them from a stage two to one or stage one to a zero, uh, really making a dramatic impact in lives. And then we looked at our UDS data and uh, historically always been in the low to mid 50% range there. And right now we're in uh, the, the mid 60s, 63, 64% range uh, with our UDS measure this year. We have never, at least under, under my tenure uh, as CMO here, seen a UDS measure for controlled hypertension 
above the mid 50%. We've never seen a 60 plus percent. So we were just ecstatic when we saw that it was most definitely working. And then once we saw it was working, we wanted to make sure we kept getting patients in to keep it working. Because certainly as the program goes on and on, what happens? Patients start to trail off. So you have to remind the patients again. Then you have to also talk to your health center staff. Uh, we, we all know uh, you train someone to do a, a new uh, program in an office setting. They're going to do it in the beginning. But unless you keep reminding them, they're going to slowly get away from the extra task and start doing the other things they were doing, and they're going to forget about it. That happened to us as well. Uh, we, we had a point in the beginning where, yeah, we were getting patients enrolled like crazy, and then all of a sudden it kind of dropped. Uh, let's if we went off a cliff. We weren't getting hardly any additional patients enrolled. They were like, what's going on? Uh, we would tell the, tell the staff tell the providers, the nursing team, even the front desk staff, and we just weren't getting any, any uh, uh, new patients to enroll in the program. So what we had to do is we created a very simple questionnaire. Uh, it was given out at the front desk to the patients as they checked in. Didn't matter if they were uh, already known to be hypertensive or not. Uh, asked one question, do you have high blood pressure? And we had it in, in English and language. They basically check yes or no. And then after that, would you be interested in having a home blood pressure monitoring device? Yes or no. And uh, based on that, then we take that back to the uh, clinical team. And then the clinical team, if they see that there's yes and yes, then they know to make sure to definitely bring it up about the remote patient monitoring program. And when we implemented that, that really contributed to a huge increase in, in, in getting additional patients into the program. And it's fortunately persisted. We've, we've had to do additional reminders, of course, because again, things kind of slack off over time. But it, it, just saying uh, the, the things that you have to kind of think about uh, ahead of time, uh, there's a lot more into RPM than, than, what, than what you think. And I, I think uh, we've definitely learned a lot uh, with, with this. And I, and I definitely know moving forward, I, I'd like to get uh, RPM for home glucose monitoring initiated in the corporation. And I, I know moving forward when we do that, I'm definitely going to make sure we have a committee set up and meet very regularly. And I have a set of, set of questions and items. I want to definitely make sure we go over and make sure we're dotting our I's mm -hmm. and definitely crossing all our T's. Dr. Noor, you covered a lot of bases there and all really, really fantastic information and lessons learned most importantly, because you're, you're right. Like we, we've, um, we partnered with over a hundred different healthcare organizations from top 20 health systems to two doctor physician groups in rural Louisiana and everything in between. And, um, the number one thing we say is that RPM and CC, all these care management programs, they're not, you know, software driven, they are workflow and you're dealing with people and patients and people that are typically non-compliant. And so getting, you know, the enrollment and onboarding uh, process nailed down, the software interoperability nailed down, the financial ROI with how does this all flow and be sustainable long-term, the patient engagement, driving the clinical outcomes and the care management component of it, the actual patient management, um, all of those go hand in hand together. And you know, it's it's not a, oh, we can do two and figure out the other three along the way type thing. You have to really understand all that up front to make this a successful program. And I think you guys live that really well to say, hey, we thought about one and two, but three, four and five, those were, you know, challenges for us along the way. And now you, you, you figure it out and you find a partner that can help you navigate those challenges as you think about doing those things internally with your own resources or looking at a vendor to, to you know, a partner to, you know, bring those services to the table as well. Um, and I also just pulled up while you were talking because you jumped into the clinical outcomes and that was going to be my next question too about the clinical ROI. But, you know, we have some really exciting and visual impressive outcomes here that you touched on, but just for the audience to see, like, these are improvements in uncontrolled patients in systolic, diastolic, and pulse pressure changes. And um, for everyone's knowledge, if you look, we were reducing systolic blood pressure an average of 8.4 millimeters of mercury from pre and post. A five-point reduction in systolic blood pressure is associated with a 10% reduction in the incidence of a cardiovascular event. 
and we're reducing it by 8.4 points. And, you know, this is uh, to Dr. Norris point, really just scratching the surface here of the patient engagement, the direct of the program. Um, what we've seen from our experience with other organizations is that the longer patients enrolled in, in an RPM program, assuming the right management, patient managers in place, the better the improve improvements and outcomes are. So duration of enrollment and clinical efficacy were directly correlated, as we saw in our larger patient populations and, and results that we, we published on, on health snaps and holistically. But this is really impressive and a huge testament, obviously, Dr. Noor and Jamie, to both of your, you know, your teams and uh, RHCC and the program that you guys have implemented as a uh, an early progressive uh, adopter of RPM, and more importantly, how you're thinking about it long-term in the future as well with additional use cases. And um, now with, you know, opportunities to make this more sustainable. Um, it's a good segue also into now, I think, what well, you were just getting into, Dr. Noor. Um, what are the long-term goals, right? You have obviously, you started with hypertension management. Um, you touched on the type 2 diabetes and glucose management piece, but what are the long-term goals? You know, I touched on the 2024 ruling. Um, what's top of mind for, for your team as you guys think about the new rulings and um, how do you expect that the changes that I went through will help um, you know, RHCC one, achieve those goals to drive long-term initiatives. And, um, you know, what else are you excited for down the, down the road as well, when it comes to RPM and these types of programs? Oh, well, de definitely. I'm, I'm very excited about the CMS ruling, uh, without a doubt. I mean, um, just kind of, as we talked a little bit, there's a lot that goes into implementing an RPM program. Uh, it's, it's not as easy as you might think it to be. And it's glad to see that uh, health centers, office centers can be rewarded uh, for, for all their work and dedication uh, when utilizing an RPM program to help a patient's health. Uh, that there, how many times do you provide a service and uh, you, you're doing it as goodwill, of course, and uh, it, you know, it's your job to take care of patients and uh, keep them healthy as long as you can but you're not getting uh, reimbursed for it, for a, vari a various service you're providing. It's just really nice to see that CMS has recognized you know, that RPM does work. Uh, it's becoming very, very common. It can be utilized for many different health conditions, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, chronic heart failure, uh, and, and the like. And it's just glad to see that uh, we're going to be able to get some uh, reimbursement for all our efforts because it, it, it truly is a, a multidisciplinary team effort uh, within a health center. It's not just me doing it. It's not just the nurse doing it. It's not just the front desk staff. It's everybody doing it. And, and then uh, your people in the background that are working more in, in depth with the data and all that it is truly a huge team effort. It's good to see we're getting reimbursed, but definitely uh, the, the sky's the limit. Uh, really, uh, definitely uh, diabetes, uh, home glucose monitoring is, is uh, next on my list uh, to, to look at. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, money again becomes an, an issue uh, with, with getting devices and paying for those devices. So certainly uh, being an FQHC, looking for grant funding to help out with that is going to be kind of big on our list. Uh, we, we've participated in uh, heart failure uh, initiatives, uh, home heart failure study initiatives in the past, and they, they've worked out so-so. But I think now, since RPM has become so much more in the forefront, uh, I think if, if we get into something that, like that again, it'll be a lot more successful. You know, the, the, the uh, patients uh, can actually step on a step on their scale once a morning and, and records their weight, uh, that they can put their finger on a pulse ox, and record their pulse ox. They can put their arm in the uh, uh, blood pressure device, get their blood pressure and their pulse, and all that data goes right on over to, to their provider to look at every day. And if something's blinking red or alert or learning, provider knows to follow up. Oh, you, you gain three pounds in a day. Uh, maybe you need to take an extra 20 milligrams if you're diuretic. Make sure we don't get you back in, in heart failure and get you hospitalized. So I, I think really the sky's the limit, and I'm just so glad uh, RPM has, has moved to the forefront of healthcare today. Yeah, it's um, it's the ultimate testimonial. I think um, 
you know, when you look at the the workflow component of it, then you start seeing the magic of the clinical and financial ROI of these programs. And you know, I've used the word sustainability probably 12 times today because that's really what it comes down to. It's like you you obviously see the impact right now and what you've seen. Um, but you know, this change right now is a major sustainability um solution for FQHCs and RHCs that again, the patient demographic, the population is the ones that most likely need a program like this the most nationally. Um, and I think the the opportunities to your point, the the sky's the limit. And you know, finding uh partners and resources to help do these programs across different comorbidities and again at scale, which I think is the biggest thing that we've experienced when we work with our partners that a lot of times they try to do these types of programs. They can't get past that 50 patient mark, 100 patient mark. And there's thousands of patients in their you know communities that have these chronic conditions that would greatly benefit from an RPM program or a CCM program, for example. Um, Jamie, was there anything else you wanted to add there about long-term goals from your perspective and you know how you're thinking about uh, patient impact as well? Um, I, I think you, you and Dr. Noor have hit on the, the main thing is that, you know, with with the potential for reimbursement, um, you know, that's just going to allow us to extend these uh, services uh, to more patients. And, and you know, when, when we start talking about doing these remote uh, patient monitoring uh, devices you know the data has to go somewhere somebody has to manage that data and decide what to do with it um, and, and that all takes time and the reimbursement will definitely help us with uh, you know taking care of uh, extra staff because that's what it'll it'll come down to uh, there's got to be staff uh, compensated for their time we, we you know uh, most uh, fqhcs are you know not profit driven. Uh, so it'll, it'll be a great help. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And, um, there was a question actually a couple that came in. So, um, I, I think we could, we could spend the next, you know, maybe five to 10 minutes going through Q and a, and then a, a wrap up here. But, um, a question just came in about the importance of patient activation and adherence to RPM and for specifically hypertension management. Dr. Nora, you touched on that before about your learnings about, you know, it's not a, hey, the patient has a blood pressure cuff and all of a sudden they're going to, you know, just use it every day because they want to get healthier, you know, just because they have that device. So um, the question was how much time was like spent on patient engagement and making sure they are staying compliant? Um, and then how were you tracking that from a KPI perspective? Like, did you have any ways of, you know, tracking the performance of the, the compliance of the patient? Did you use like a component of a software within HealthSnap, for example, to track that? Um, what was helpful for your your team today and how you think about it as well in the future? Yes, definitely a wonderful question. Uh, I, I got to say uh, HealthSnap has been, and not, I'm not bragging on HealthSnap because we're utilizing HealthSnap, but- You can brag on uh, us, that's okay. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't, it's unsolicited. But uh, I, I got to say, uh, it's been most helpful uh, from day one uh, and, and up to the present. Uh, from from the initial initial meetings uh, with the demonstrations of what they had to offer uh, to getting integrated to uh, starting the whole RPM uh, program and uh, frequent check-ins. Uh, HealthSnap in the beginning, I believe, we're doing monthly or maybe even um, more frequent. Might have been biweekly check-ins in the very beginning of our implementation to make sure things were going right. And then it will go out to uh, um, every month uh, check-ins virtually. And along with that, uh, we would get sent data uh, every month and more frequently as needed uh, about number of patients that have enrolled, uh, can break it down by provider. So you can see what providers are being more proactive, trying to get their hypertensive patients in the program and which are not. Uh, you, you can see how many patients are being compliant with doing their readings every day or two versus those that have slipped off and, and gotten away from doing regular readings. And we, we, we uh, what we were getting at one point uh, with all that is uh, our, our nursing director, you know, she decided to be the lead to get the uh, email alerts uh, um, about patients that aren't being compliant with submitting their data. 
And for a while, it was truly overwhelming. I mean, she was getting numerous emails and came to a point where she didn't know what to do with them. So, you know, we had we set up uh, some private time with uh, Health Snap and, and arranged a workaround where she would receive uh, every two weeks, I think it was every two weeks or four weeks, uh, a list of patients, just one whole list, and they would be categorized by provider. And that way, our nursing director could then take that list of, say, provider A and send that list out securely through email to provider A and, and the nursing staff and let them know, hey, these patients are not being compliant with doing their readings regularly. Can you guys please follow up with those patients accordingly to try to get them start checking their readings? And she would do that with each of our uh, health center sites. And when, when we just trim that workflow with, with that little uh, initiative, it really helped a whole lot. Uh, we, we saw bumps uh, for the better uh, with our compliance. So it, it, it's just such a, uh, it's like a wheel in, in constant motion. Things come up you don't think about uh, that you have to uh, find answers to later on. Uh, we, we didn't even think of KPIs uh, in the beginning, we, we were just focused on get as many patients enrolled as we can. We had 22 patients, 2,200 patients in our denominator, you know, and, and uh, we're, we're four or five months in and we have uh, under 150 patients enrolled and I'm freaking out thinking, oh my gosh, what are, what are we going to do? Uh, what, what, what are we going to do? Her, her said, they're going to... Uh, take all our money back for this grant. We're, we're not getting patients enrolled. We're, we're not doing our job. You know, so it, it's just things that come up uh, over time that you learn you have to try to think about and find work around to, to, to get the job done. And one thing to add to on like the software component also, we track a measurement called transmission index and you can actually sort patients by that. Um, and so it's a component of your partner too in the portal to say, we have a percent that says patients that, um, if that percent is, let's say 50%, that means that in the last 30 days, they've taken a reading on 50% of those days. So we track an index from one, the least compliant or zero to 100%. They're taking readings on every day and you can sort that way and create alerts for that. Um, and we have non-compliance triggers as well to say, if a patient hasn't taken a reading in two consecutive days, then you can notify an individual about that. So, um, there's a lot of different, you know, tools that, um, the software component can enable that outreach for the engagement side, both for the compliance and for the clinical engagement as well. So um, I think those two components go hand in hand for engagement and for the actual care management. Yeah, and and I and I think one thing uh, in addition with the with the software is, you know, it's not just available and easily navigatable and reviewable by the uh, clinical team, but also the patients. You know, patients can log into their accounts and, and see how their readings are going and, and they have access to look at it in a graph form, a linear graph. And if they see the their numbers are graphing upwards to the worse, uh, it, it might per, uh, uh, pursue them to maybe call their provider and say, hey, my, my readings, they're, they're, they're going up and up and up. They're not stabilizing. What, what should I do? So just, just another way that uh, how re remote patient monitoring uh, just helps improve the overall uh, provider-patient relationship and, and that overall scope of care uh, for the patient. Really well said, Dr. Noor. Um, that patient self-efficacy, their ability to understand their condition and manage it more um, real-time based on the readings and actually seeing that, so they understand, oh, my lifestyle, my behaviors impact my readings based on what I'm doing day to day. And I can actually visually see that now and be empowered to control my condition more so or engage with my clinician when I feel like I'm not trending the right way. So that health efficacy is that is really, really a huge component of, of an RPM program and the literature supports that as well. Um, we have a couple minutes left here. Uh, we can wrap up with some additional questions as they come in. Um, or if, if not, we can, we can spend the last time here with any closing remarks, Dr. Noor, you'd like, or, or Jamie to add here in terms of, you know, again, your experience with RPM and then the final ruling and how you're thinking about it for 24. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I would say take home messages for, for me is, uh, definitely research your vendor. Um, 
look at customers that they've been working with, talk to them, see how the vendors worked out for other other places. Uh, look at look at their patient portal. Look at their ability to integrate into the, your electronic medical record. So you want to look at things to make additional work as less cumbersome as possible for your clinical team. They they do enough day in and day out, and you don't want them having to do additional steps when they're in a patient's chart to, to, to see how their blood pressures have been doing uh, remotely. Uh, uh, also, uh, uh, navigation, M make sure it's easy to navigate both from your end and the patient's end. Think about Bluetooth versus cellular. Uh, definitely very, very important. M make sure your vendor's devices are um, validated devices. Uh, if they're not officially validated, th then uh, you're taking a chance by using those devices. They might not have the accuracy of a device that's been officially, formally validated. And, and Jamie, I'll, I'll let you add on from the more clinical uh, direct patient uh, provider level, anything else you want to add? Sure. Um, most most uh, providers uh, that may be listening uh, are aware of what they call uh, white coat syndrome. And I have a few patients uh, that obviously have that issue. Um, th they come into the clinic, uh, their blood pressure is elevated. Uh, it doesn't matter how long you let them sit there and, uh, you know, just sort of relax. Uh, the blood pressure is still going to be elevated. And I've, I've, I've seen this several times since we started using the RPM uh, system uh, you know, they take their blood pressures at home. Wonderful readings. I can go on to the Health Snap website. I can see the monthly average uh, is beautiful. But if I if I go on what I have in the clinic and adjust their medications, uh, and then they experience some hypotension, dizziness, or fainting, uh, the likelihood of them to be compliant with the medication regimen is sort of out the window at that point. Uh, so it's been very helpful for me to be able to go and see, well, you know, they're they're doing well at home on their, their current regimen. There's no need to make an adjustment. Uh, and, and I think that's beneficial to me and the patient. Yeah, really powerful. I think, um, you know, we always say it's like enable the clinicians to have the most actionable data so that they can be the most proactive in their care delivery. Um, it's a phrase we've used a lot. And um, I think what you're both saying here is a true testament to that in the real world. Um, and it's extremely powerful and exciting to hear. And um, I'll wrap with that. Um, both of you, thank you so much for your time joining us today. This has been extremely, extremely uh, you know, in informative, both in terms of new rulings for 2024 for FQHCs and RHCs, your personal experience as an, a, a, an FQHC implementing RPM with a grant and now thinking about long-term with new reimbursement opportunities and your insights are extremely valuable. So thank you so much. Uh, we're exactly at 12 p.m. Eastern, so we're going to wrap here. Thank you all so much. If anyone has any questions, feel free to reach us at healthsnap.io. And then I put on the chat as well a link to a comprehensive blog capturing all of the changes for 2024 and the fee schedule that you can re read more on your own. And of course, the Health Snap team is available for questions um, at any time. So thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your Fridays and we look forward to hearing from you all soon. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you all so much.